All right, well, welcome back from break. Um, so I want to talk to you about uh, a landscape perspective of the ecosystem approach. Um, this is uh, a combined effort of both the Alaska, or from the Alaska Center for Conservation Science um, at the University of Alaska in Anchorage, where I am, um, the Scenario Network for Arctic and Alaska Planning, which is up here in, in Fairbanks, and the Institute of Social and Economic Research. And uh, I'll get back to why there's so many people in it. But um, so the Department of Interior in, in the US has created this landscape approach concept um, that I think builds on the ecosystem approach kind of fundamentals. And, and um, they have laid it out sort of like this. And, and although they don't say seascape, I, I think this perfectly fits within the seascape kind of approach as well. But this is, this is how they conceptualize how uh, the ecosystem approach might be manifested within landscape management. And so they, they first identify these ecoregional assessments or regional assessments, some sort of you know, baseline assessment that I think we've heard a lot about and, and what I'm going to talk about. And then that feeds into the sort of this regional conservation strategy that builds off that, that baseline from that assessment into mitigation and into monitoring frameworks. And this is all built within that adaptive kind of management wagon wheel that I think we've all seen a lot. Of. Um, so, so the rapid eco-regional assessments are actually the Bureau of Land Management's response to the landscape approach. And um, they are the first within the Department of Interior to kind of embrace the landscape approach and operationalize it, at least in, in the form of these assessments. And so um, these are the key outcomes from the REAs, the, the rapid eco-regional assessments. It's really to, to provide a baseline for conservation data you know, something that's, that's seamless, that everyone kind of agrees on, this is the current status. Um, it develops distribution models for key ecosystem resources, so spatially explicit distribution models. Um, and this is based on a, a conceptual model of how the ecosystem works. And I'll go into that in a little bit. And it follows the coarse filter, fine filter approach, approach of Reed Noss. And so that, that kind of gets you into the um, ecological integrity realm of, of um, assessing ecosystems. And then it looks at the distributions of major change agents. And this is really important because it recognizes that ecosystems are not static. They are constantly moving, evolving, adapting, responding to different stressors. And so uh, they've, they've identified kind of four top ones. That, and this is a program that's, that's across the, the Western US. And, and again, it's mostly terrestrial. So it's focused on terrestrial factors like climate, wildfire, invasive species. In land use and development. Up in Alaska, we've got permafrost like most Arctic nations, and so that's kind of one of those change agents. Also, could be considered uh, uh, something of ecological you know, value, an ecosystem resource in itself, but largely considered something that's going to fundamentally change the landscape according to certain trends. And then, it, you know, the, the, the magic of GIS, the magic of spatial um, planning, it's a, it puts it all together. Says, okay, well, this is the status of uh, you know all these ecosystem resources. This is what we understand about them now and, and where they might be in the future, and that provides, I think, the basis for an ecosystem approach. So I've identified the three areas where I think the the rapid ecoregional assessments kind of fit into that ecosystem approach. Um, it it helps identify the ecosystem. I'm going to step through the example for the North Slope here in a minute. It describes the ecosystem and then it assesses the ecosystem. Um, so these are the three uh, rapid eco-regional assessments that we've been part of in Alaska. You can see they're, they're kind of big geographies. Um, and I, I think in the Arctic we're used to thinking about big geographies, but, but um, especially for something that synthesizes everything we know about an ecosystem. This is kind of big. Um, and so that's my one, I think, tied to the LMEs is just, you know, the, the spatial size in which you're operating infinitely increases the complexity. But anyway, this is the North Slope, and so um, I, I draw this with the ecoregional boundaries because the boundaries were defined ecologically, not administratively. Although we do cut off a of Canada, but whatever. We, we, we tried our best to define these ecologically. Um, and, and so we, we define it based on ecoregions. I think it's very synonymous with the LMEs. Um, and then this gives you an idea of the, the sort of management realm of that ecoregion. And these are all the different land managers so folks with, with stake in this landscape. And so um, the assessment had to engage all of these folks and say, okay, we're working across all these barriers, these boundaries um, to synthesize data. So this will make your brain hurt. It makes my brain hurt every time I look at it. It's a $30,000 model because it's just a whole bunch of like thinking about how the ecosystem works. 
And even though it's really general and vague in this concept, a lot of thought is going into these connections between the different functions and system components of the ecosystem. It looks at external factors, it looks at intrinsic factors, and it puts it all down. And this is really good. And this was actually vetted through all land managers. I mean, this is not just a scientific perspective. This is like a functional perspective of how the ecosystem really, really works. And then we really focus in on these different factors within the, the ecosystem that we want to understand what is, what is their status? Um, what are the key functions? Or what are the key players in the, in the ecosystem? And this is kind of the science behind it, right? So we say, okay, functionally we need these components to be working in some way, shape, or form in order to the, for the entire ecosystem to work. And so from this, we develop a list. And you'll see coastal and, and ocean is in here, even though it was a primarily terrestrial assessment. We're not totally ignorant to the fact that there's an exchange of nutrients and, and animals and, and all kinds of things. Um, so this gives you an idea of some of those key uh, habitats. So this is what we would call the coarse filter um, things. Those are the, the, the provide the foundational ecosystem um, resources uh, for, the, for the region. And this gives you an example of, of just a couple of them. If anybody's familiar at all with the Arctic, this should seem pretty familiar as well as the species, right? Um, so these are all key terrestrial species, and these are selected based on the ecosystem conceptual model, but as well as sort of their interaction or their importance to subsistence hunters. And so um, it's not just purely ecological, but it's also this interaction between social and ecological uh, resource. And so these were the, the, the species selected for that, and, and you'll see it ranges from not just the you know, megafauna and, and fuzzy things, but, but you know, core ecosystem components. Um, we assess both terrestrial and, and aquatic, um, you know, in terms of freshwater resources. So these are the example of the aquatic habitats looked at, um, and then aquatic species. And so the idea is when you look at all of these and you start looking at them as a group of functional members in the ecosystem, you start to infer something about the ecosystem integrity or what, what the ecosystem trajectory might be. And then you throw in all these things that we know are changing. Um, some of these have been changing for a long time. Some of them are relatively recent. Some of them haven't come here yet, like invasive species. But it, there are things that can fundamentally change the landscape. So these are the five, four uh, required, you know, as part of the overall program. And then we add in, um, or plus permafrost, and then of course the, the 800 pound gorilla is this, you know, climate change thing. Um, and they just said, you know, it says climate change. There's no, there's no guidance on that, right? And I think a lot of us can kind of relate to that. Oh, address climate change in this assessment, or address climate change in this report. And so, well, what component? <laughs> And so I'll kind of give you some examples of that. And really where the magic comes is when we put it all together. So everybody, you know, we've seen species distribution models an awful lot. We've, we've talked about potentially like bioclimatic envelope models, but nobody's really put, the, put together sort of a species status in terms of, you know, looking at ecological integrity. So we've got some integrated products that we call landscape condition, which is sort of cumulative effects model or cumulative impacts model from a human development perspective. And I'll, I'll show you results of that. Um, and then we use that to assess the current and future status of species distribution. So given where they are in the landscape, how does their under, underlying fundamental habitat change? And then we start to spell out those specific linkages between those key ecosystem resources and climate change and the other change agents. Um, and we roll it all up into this cumulative stressor index. So this is the landscape condition model. This is um, based on NatureServe's work, and NatureServe operates, I think, pretty globally. So if you don't know about them and want to know about them, um, come and ask me. But it basically assigns different weights to the different types of human land uses and assumes a decay from that. And so you get this nice seamless surface of sort of human disturbance. And um, not surprisingly, on the North Slope, it's, it's pretty darn undisturbed, except for where we expect it to be. Um, and you can kind of see that. Um, in the current and then even in the long term we were able to interact with um, a, an oil and gas scenarios project to kind of get future human footprint estimates which was really cool um, because doing a trend of future human footprint in an arctic region is shooting in the dark um, there is no refined or systematic way to do that except for through a scenario process so we were able to use leverage um, their work 
And this can go into things like landscape integrity, you know, identifying large intact blocks and, and those potential vulnerable areas, which um, gets at some of the ecological you know, integrity kind of concepts, and this just blows it up for where we know there are some development, there is development on the North Slope. And then we can look at species status. And, and so for greater white and goose, we can basically just really simple FGIS exercise, take that la underlying landscape condition you know, the relative intactness of that habitat and look at where the geese are. And we can see there's a pinch point. There's a place where there's an awful lot of habitat, you know, modification, not necessarily, you know, removal or destruction, but modification in some, in some key areas. Um, and so this is kind of rolled up with some of the other species into this, this idea of, you know, how intact the, the ecosystem is. But then we look beyond the human footprint and we say, okay, well, what about these other change agents that we know are happening? Let's start defining them. And so we, again, we go back to a conceptual model. A lot of thought goes into, okay, so, so for habitats, for connected lakes, how do we think? What are the specific mechanisms that either literature knows about or that um, managers are thinking about or managing for? What are the mechanisms in which climate change is going to impact those connected lakes? And we spell those out. And then we identify what, which ones have spatial information for and which ones need you know, more research for and, and that sort of thing. And then we develop, for the ones that do have spatial information, um, some maps, some analyses that, that say, okay, we obviously know thermokarst. We, we saw the, the uh, thermokarst model yesterday uh, from Bob. Uh, we know thermokarst potential is, is um, you know, has the, or thermokarsting has the potential to drain an awful lot of lakes in the region. And so where is that thermokarst highest potential? That gives you an idea of the status now and, and potentially in the future for this key habitat component, something that's crucial for the ecosystem to function. Um, we can also look at you know, derivatives of climate. And so we developed, I don't know, probably 40 or 50 different derivatives of climate change, things that, that would make a difference. And then so in terms of terrestrial habitats, we looked at all those, those core habitats and how length of growing season would change. And this is just simply recognizing that, yeah, climate's going to change, but it's not equal across an entire ecoregion. We need to spatialize. We need to understand which ecosystem components are going to be more impacted by changes in growing season than other parts of the ecoregion. And so this kind of combines those two notions. I think this does an even better illustration. This shows caribou calving grounds and the changes in May temperature, the expected changes in May temperature between now and, and 2060s. Again, it's not spatially even. It's not like all caribou cabin grounds are going to be impacted by climate the same way. And so by putting this into a spatial framework, we can then understand some parts are going to be more vulnerable than others. And when we roll that all up into an entire ecoregional approach, we, we get a better sense of where the vulnerabilities are. Um, same kind of thing here, with, but with Arctic foxes and, and um, January temperature. Again, it's not spatially even. You know, there are areas where they're going to be more impacted than others. Um, so what we do is we take all these, and, and in some cases, well, most cases, we don't have enough to say for each of these vectors what the direct impacts are going, to, are going to be for the species. And so as a general index of cumulative change, so we said we're looking at all these different change agents, let's roll them all up into one kind of unified look at where things are going to change the most. We're not saying what is going to, what the ecosystem resources are going to be impacted by most, but this should definitely guide monitoring and further in investment into uh, those potential impacts. But this is basically just a roll up. This is just saying, okay, Given what we know about model variability, given what we know about spatial variability, the spatial resolution of this information, where can we say things are actually going to change? And if they're actually going to change, we're going to count that. We're going to say it's going to change there. And then we're going to look and see it across all these factors. Are these other things changing? And this gives you sort of that, that inverse of a, a vulnerability, but that hot spot of, of change kind of um, uh, assessment. So. Um, and, and you can kind of look at it across time. You can look at it in, in terms of the number of impacts. We've even done it in, in terms of land management, ownership, and, and status. Um, you know, looking at how much, how much proportion of, say, BLM or, or Fish and Wildlife Service um, of their land is going to be under, you know, various numbers of, of stressors. And so, um, it's been really, it's been really good, a, a good conversation starter for just the magnitude, both in the near term and the long term, of how much things could uh, change. And so.
Um, I think I've got a couple minutes left. So um, just as a conclusion, I, 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 mean, I think the rapid eco regional assessments fit perfectly within this ecosystem approach. I think it's, it's built on the same kind of science, and I'm really excited to see the marine side of this um, because we've spent a lot of time thinking of the terrestrial side, but not necessarily about the synthesis between the, the two. And, and so that's on my next slide about next steps. But um, REA takes this kind of systematic approach, and that's what I think is, is so unique. It's, it's built on a conceptual model. It's, it's built on a functioning system, assuming a functioning system. Um, and I really like some of the tools coming out of this because they're so rapidly updatable. And that's, that's again, it's really important, especially in Arctic systems, as these things are changing so fast, we want to be able to update these things, look at multiple stressors, look at um, things like ecological integrity. Um, so some of the next steps I, I envision for, the, for this is, well, looking into a range of different future conditions, because these are sort of trends and, and one look at climate and, and everything. And, and so a, a more in-depth ecological scenario analysis would be really robust in this kind of framework. And I think absolutely necessary, given, given that everything is constantly changing. Um, and then, but yeah, really integrate with the, the LMEs and the spatial marine planning. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity if we're built on the same kind of conceptual models. Um, and I think about it, especially in terms of subsistence harvest. So uh, when we go to communities and present our current thinking on, on how this system operated, they say, well, what's, what about the whales? What about the walrus? What about these the other things? You know, and, and it really dawned on me, they use this portfolio approach to subsistence, right? If they're not taking caribou, then they're taking other animals in the, in the marine environment. So we can't just say things are going to happen for the caribou and things are going to happen for the lemmings or the geese. We have to look at the full suite portfolio of potential subsistence species and look at it in that same context. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. But also, um, all this does is identify an awful lot of things that we think are going to be changing. And um, I think the best way to, to sort of document that is through this community-based CBONS kind of perspective, um, especially since we're such a broad geography, especially since there's, there's so limited spatial data um, for mo many of these areas. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So with that, just some acknowledgments. Um, this assessment, I've, I've heard in a couple talks, you know, it's really important to engage uh, a broad suite of stakeholders and making sure that this is, um, you know, meeting the needs of everyone. And so the REAs are set up to have an assessment management team. So all those folks in the, in the right there, um, all those agencies were participants, active participants, and actually drove this assessment and guided us on which species and habitats we selected. And so um, it's a good example of, I think, of that collaborative sort of science. And then those are all co-authors and, and co-contributors. So with that, happy to take questions. Okay.